Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for making it uh, here for day seven of BCBT. And uh, I think uh, it was very appropriate that uh, Anil Seth started off our 10th anniversary school, uh, and that, uh, in a way, Paul is, is closing it here by giving the first talk on this final day. Um, just to say a little bit more about BCBT, because uh, I first met Paul, uh, we were working out that it was in the early 2000s. I'm not sure we got closer than that. Uh, he was reviewing a European project I was involved with, and the project had some problems. And Paul came in and gave us a very clear and forthright analysis of, of where the problems were, uh, which I appreciated, actually, and it helped make that a better project. And uh, I kind of recognized then that, that Paul was somebody that cared deeply about science and also about the, what we were trying to do in, in this, that project and in many projects since, which is to take a new approach uh, to the, the field of neuroscience and psychology, which is to try and understand by building. And uh, Paul, like myself, began as a psychologist. And uh, so I think that we're interested in the same fundamental questions about the nature of the human condition. And uh, we, he has pursued that, I think, in various ways by looking at various aspects of cognition. But uh, his work in the last few years, I think, has really come back to this core question of how all that gets integrated to create the, the human and to, to make a mind and to give us experience. And the work he's been doing in those last few years, I think, is starting to help unlock this real puzzle of how brains give rise to minds and uh, why we are as we are. So uh, it's, uh, it's great to hear Paul present on these topics because he always has so many ideas that when I hear him present, uh, I want to hear some more details on these things. So I'm not sure exactly what flavor of DAC we'll get today, but uh, there'll be something interesting and new for me here, I'm sure. And for those of you that don't know distributed adaptive control, this will be a great lesson in how to think about how the brain works. Paul. Great, Tony. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, it's funny, after this review that Tony mentioned, I think Tony was the only guy still talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked because we're still talking, right? Um, so yeah, I, wa I want to also stay a little bit in the scene. Oh, Miguel's waving at me. I guess it's not because he likes me. Oh, okay, I did it. Um, oops, yep. So, uh, so I, to stay within the theme of all the lectures that, that we looked at over the last few days, um, I'm, I'm trying to pick up the pieces a little bit, right? Because we heard a, a lot about different details and systems and subsystems in the brain and what they might do, how they're built from different cellular components, what these cells might do and so on. But of course, obviously strong emphasis on, on hippocampus. But I think the big challenge we actually are really facing is to really put all these pieces of the puzzle together and come back to an idea of, of how the brain works as a, as a system. So this is then a bit my mission today. Um, and the theme within that is very much this concept of living machines, of which we also, uh, with Anna and Tony, uh, run a conference that's annual, and we're planning now to do it next year, 2018, in, in Paris. And you're all very much invited to join us there. So, um, of course, the work I present is, is the result and the product of, of the activities of many people. Um, this is at some point in, in time, not that long ago, um, and because to, to, to look at the brain from the system's perspective is definitely not something you do on your own, right? There's a, a lot of effort involved and there are a lot of disciplines involved from biology and engineering to computer science and psychology, etc. So what I'm presenting is teamwork and I'm very grateful to that, to that team. Um, so... Let's start with a simple question. That's the one question I would like to answer today. Um, and it is just a restatement of what Tolman, um, in his presidential address to the American Psychological Associations in the 30s proposed, where he said, okay, 
Um, let's just try to understand why rats, rats turn the way they do at a choice point. Right, so the rat is in a maze, it goes left or it goes right. It's a very primitive, simple thing. And we saw a lot of that also in the different experimental uh, presentations that, that we saw in this school. And Tolman poses the right question. Now you have to know maybe a bit more background about Tolman. He was an extremely interesting character because in the 30s, as you know, the study of mind was in the grips of hardcore behaviorism which was, almost, was a very dogmatic and almost religious view on how we had to study behavior <coughs> by only paying attention to what we could observe. So it was sort of this excessive over-interpretation of operationalism, right? So science is defined through the measurement methods that we follow. And Tolman has been sort of fighting against that fr from the beginning of his career always insisting that the organism itself as an agent pursues goals and that the organism as such contributes a lot to the structuring of behavior. But he was in the minority. And that's also, but he's also then, his movement is called one of cognitive behaviorism. As you know, it was only after the Second World War that we had the cognitive revolution, which also didn't get us very far, but that's another story. Um, uh, what was the particular thing he would have in mind? Well, it was something he called vicarious trial and error, because he was saying, well, you know, we heard about Tolman earlier, right? Tolman is always mentioned in, in the discussion of the hippocampus, the cognitive map, right, that he observed because rats would take shortcuts or they would show latent learning in these mazes. But there was something on top of that that, that he observed and uh, also uh, others at that time, and that was that rats seem to show signs of actually, if you want, deliberating about their choices. So in this case, what you would observe, so here VTE essentially means that the rat stands still and moves its head left and right um, for some reason, right? Um, so we're the teammates, and then he would measure here, dependent on task difficulty, how many of these head movements he would observe, right? And then what he, what he showed, or what he, presented is that these head movements also depend on the difficulty of the task and the stage of learning in the task, right? So, and he had this idea, like it's, it's as if the rat is, if you want, using its cognitive map. It's consulting its cognitive map without moving, right? It's projecting itself into space as if it's simulating, yeah? Um, so a modern example of that can be, we can see that here. This is from Johnson and Radish. This is a classic video, and we're going to get back to that a few times. Um, so here we have the rat in the tea maze, it makes its decision, uh, and there you go. You saw it sort of move left and right, and now it did it in one trial only, and from now it knows where to get the food or the water, right? So you, you already saw a very obvious structure in this, in this behavior. In the beginning, we sort of ballistically go left or right, right? There's not much stopping or waiting, uh, at some point, at, at lap four, you see that the animal stops, and this is what Tolman was impressed by. And from then on, the animal only turns right because it knows what it is doing. Yeah? So this is what we have to try to understand. Um, so in particular, it's this, this part, right? What's happening here? Why is the rat doing it? Um, and actually, it's still an unresolved problem. All right, it's not so also even Tolman's hypothesis that this was to do with the consulting this, this cognitive map is not necessarily established. There are also people who might say, well, it's like some stereotype behavior when the rat is confused. Okay, so, so there, there is a discussion on what this really means. And I'm going to give you an answer to that after you're patient enough to listen to the slides in between this point and the slide that shows you that answer. Um, so this is now our problem. Here we have our rat in the maze. Um, we want to understand why it shows this VTE, this vicarious trial and error, the simulated trial and error. Um, and we're gonna do that in reference to its brain. And in the meantime, you've learned a lot about the brain uh, by being in the school, okay? So Tolman had a rather intricate theory about how this worked. And he summarized it in, his bo in a book in the 60s. And basically said, look, if we want to explain this kind of behavior, right, we have to speak about 
the goal-oriented behavioral tendencies, or you thought about fields, if you want, uh, that, that govern this behavior. And each of these, this is controlled by uh, six independent variables that are the drivers of behavior. So we have the drives of the animal, we have the goals or the, how, the relevance of the goal object, um, the, the, the specific properties of stimuli, the specific motor responses, are we running or pushing levers or pulling ropes or whatever. And then it's also the learning history of the animal and the actual complexity of the task. And what you, already can, what you can imagine here, of course, Tolman, this is the end of his career, he has been looking at thousands of rats in dozens of different mazes, and it's highly variable, right? And he has to try to capture all that variability in a, in a few parameters, okay? So this is his compression of, of that highly variable space of behavior. And then each of these are again modulated by what he called an uh, HATE, which is heredity, age, tr uh, training, and endocrine factors. So he already tries to bring in this variability. Now, this Tolman model did not really have a lot of traction in the field, also because it was just too complex. And also it was proposed in the time that people discovered the computer metaphor. And when they also believe we are like Turing machines. All right, so, so, so Tolman's interpretation, explanation of behavior actually died with Tolman. And I think that's a shame. Uh, and there are also people who go back to him now, not only in terms of the cognitive map, as you heard earlier, but also people like David Reddish, who very specifically look at this VTE kind of behavior that Tolman talks about. So let's answer Tolman's question. Um, all right, so let's try to break it down in the, in the fundamental problems we've got to solve now, right? So if you're the rat in the maze, right, there, there are a number of things you've got to solve, or if you want, the number of objectives that you have to optimize. The first one is how, or what do I do? What do I do now? How do I solve this problem? How do I act? Right, what's my action? And in my opinion, this can be then, you, you, you've solved this how problem, and this is gonna be a heuristic, which you're gonna look at the brain, okay? So it's going, we can use this functional analysis of behavior or interpretation to, to, as a guideline to look at different systems in the brain and how they solve that. And in my opinion, once the, the rat, in order to answer this how question, like how do I get to my reward? It has to actually identify four other problems. Uh, let's solve this. And that is, okay, first motivation. So we're, this is very compatible with what also Tolman talks about. Am I hungry or am I thirsty? Right, if I'm hungry, I might wanna go somewhere else when I'm thirsty. Um, and this is also compatible with the Tolman model. What? What are these objects in the world? How do they pertain to my goals? Um, and then spatial, the spatial structure of the task. Where am I? Where are the objects? Where are the obstacles? Where are the surfaces, right? So how do I now structure my, how can I structure my, my behavior over time in space? And I think that's a very dedicated objective we have to solve, and then when is essentially how do I time and sequence my behavior? What's the order in which I should do things in order to resolve this how problem? Okay, so I take this, in my opinion, this is a fundamental decomposition of then the, the, the foundational objective functions that the brain has to solve in order to deal with the physical world. And I make an important distinction here between the physical and the social world, to which I will get back later. So now we're just constraining ourselves. We have one animal, one rat, in a box, in a maze, solving a problem on its own. There are no other agents around. Um, so now... Do you compare to Tom and you're leaving out the, uh, the variability of the individual difference? <coughs> you're right, absolutely. Yeah, you, so uh, if we go back to Tom, no, you're right. So um, individual variability, I will get to later because I think what Tolman uh, was not sensitive enough to is this idea of exploration. Exploration gives you variability, in my opinion. So as opposed to breaking it down for each of these controlling variables, right, you could also propose that, of course, there's 
phenotypic variability for different reasons, but I think there's a driver of this variability that he did not really identify, which is mechanisms of exploration. Okay, we'll get back to, back to that later, and I think this can account for a lot of variability. Let's say the basic physical interaction with the world, right, and its nonlinearities. Yeah? Um, but I was not necessarily trying to recapitulate the Tolman notion, I'm trying to compress it a bit more. Yeah? Um, so, brain. This might look like the answer, but it is just the first step towards that. Okay, so basically what I'm proposing, and that's what I said earlier, we can use this functional decomposition also as a heuristic, right? It doesn't mean it's true, but it means it might be a way to think about all this complexity in the brain. And what I'm going to pursue is the hypothesis that part the the, the why question is partially answered, and I'm going to give you examples of that, by, by brainstem and midbrain structures. Um, that the what problem is partially answered by uh, perceptual systems of the brain. And of each of these, I'm going to give you examples, how we pursued models of, of these structures and how to then resolve that specific um, functional objective. Um, where is very much as you know uh, with a, a hippocampal function. Uh, when I'll, I'm looking particularly at the cerebellum and the integration of these objectives into one policy for action or one how, the thing I'm going to do, we're going to look at from the perspective of the prefrontal cortex. Okay? Um, and then after that I'm going to show you how we bring all these pieces together in one integrated model that shows that this way of thinking about the brain is not completely unreasonable. Um, why I say un not unreasonable is that we have to also be clear about what it means to have a theory about the brain, about anything, or a model. Right? So a theory is, or a model of the brain is not supposed to be true. It doesn't need to be true. Right? It's all about having empirical support, right? or what Bas van Frasen would call is that um, you have to be empirically adequate. Right? Or in other words, a model is the most adequate description at a point in time of the data we have available. And as new data becomes available, models will become invalid and they will be improved. So models are that sense not static structures. They are evolving as also the data evolves. And sometimes data will just invalidate very fundamental assumptions that these models make and then you got to reject them, right? So what I'm pursuing here is a model, and that's called distributed adaptive control. This is a very abstract representation of it that we're going to unpack all these different boxes. Um, it's not true as such. It's, it's a way to, to look at the data, right? It tries to be empirically adequate, okay? Um, but that means at this very high level, when I say, okay, these boxes and arrows tell me about core processes and their information exchange, each of these boxes and arrows, of course, makes empirical predictions, whether you like it or not. Every assumption behind such a box or an arrow is if you want a testable prediction or a testable hypothesis. Yeah? So that's how you look at these very abstract models where you say, well, this gives me a comprehensive framework to look at behavior and to look at how this policy question of how can be resolved by solving these, these sub-challenges. And then from each of these boxes, I start to make predictions. And now I can look in detail at different brain structures. So that's, that's what we actually do, right? So DAC is um, basically looking at the brain as a control structure. It's saying brains are not computers. Um, brains are also not primarily information processors but brains are control systems. They control the body and they control the interaction of the body with the world. Okay, and they, 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 they do that in order to optimize this, what I call H4W problem, right? The how, how do I get to the how by resolving why, what, where, and when, okay? So that also explains why I'm really interested in, in interacting with people like John Doyle, because I think control theory can help us a lot in getting frameworks to look at, at brains. Um, 
So from the perspective of control, and, and DAC is around now since the early 90s, it's a multi, it's a layered control structure, which is an important concept that also Tony introduced yesterday. Yeah, so it means we have multiple layers in which operations are performed. And that the most foundational layer in the DAC theory is the body itself. Right, the body itself with its sensors and effectors, with its needs, we need oxygen, we need glucose, etc. This already becomes part of the control system. And think about, for instance, this whole field that Rolf Pfeiffer and uh, others have been advancing called um, morphological computation, right? Where, where in the past there was this idea, look, if I think about control, I have a controller and I have a plant, the thing being controlled. And these are like two separate entities, like as in some dictatorship. Right? You have the dictator and then you have everybody else. But the insight over the last decades has been that actually if you apply this to living systems, it's not really working out very well. Okay, so from that control perspective, if I'm walking, I would have to model the plant, my body, and I would have to also very accurately predict and control the different states and state changes of that body along the degrees of freedom that I have. And a typical example people would use in morphological uh, computation is, for instance, well, if you walk, the swing phase, when the leg swings forward, is not under active control, right? It is basically a biomechanical feature of how our body is structured, right? You can lift your hip a little bit and just relax the muscle and you swing forward. It, this is not requiring the active kind of control. And people have capitalized on that with these passive walking devices that can walk for many kilometers without using much energy. Yeah, so this has been an insight that is fairly recent and I don't think it's really percolated into neuroscience very much, but the plant itself, the body, is much more part of the control system because it now also means the controllers that sit on top of that body are capitalizing on these implicit control properties of the morphology and the skeletal muscle system. So that's layer one, but that means the body gives us three distinct features. Sensory surfaces, the needs, flatworms have different needs than humans, and effectors, right? The thing, the, the, the actuators that allow you to change the conformation, the shape of the body and its position in space. Now the next level up, we have a reactive control system that's also related to what Tony was talking about yesterday. Reactive control, we're gonna talk about later in a bit more detail. It basically means this is strongly innate, predefined, automated, rapid responses, right? Um, I will give you some examples of it later, but again, now sensory states are mapped to sensations that trigger internal states like fear, right, or um, high valence when it's, uh, let's say, food item where you're hungry. So it maps to internal states and it maps that to stereotype behaviors like food consumption, defense, attack, um, sexual behaviors, and so on. Strongly predefined control loops that, that now interact with the body, but and this is a bit of the Rod Brooks domain we're in that you heard about yesterday and the Breitenberg vehicles, although in those cases, sensations are mapped directly to actions and are not um, integrated in these internal states that I call drives. Because why do we need drives? Well, when a, such a reflex is triggered, it's, it's not only relevant for the outside world, the actions you have to generate, it is actually also of great epistemic value. It tells you that something important happened to you and the world that is relevant to your existence. And so therefore at the adaptive layer level, we are solving this whole problem of labeling the world. Yes, please. 
Well, I, I, so my claim would be that it can run, these can be parallel circuits, right? So that for instance, if you have the triggering stimulus, it might bifurcate and target two, okay? The key thing is, so because you don't want to lose time, you still want to have a rapid response to your reflex, yeah. right? Or to the, to the stimulus in your reflex. But what I'm, con what I'm adding to this is to say, no, but now you want to also signal that to the rest of the system because it's, it's also a trigger for learning, okay? So it can run in parallel, it doesn't need to be conditional. No, not at this level, because here, the purpose of this diagram is just really give you the most abstracted top level view on this deck architecture. Because as you will see later, there are many more arrows we can draw, right? But, but to just have a feeling for the layering and this columnar organization, this is the top level representation. That's why I don't want to, that's why I don't make these kinds of more nuanced uh, distinctions at this stage, but they're there, you're right, they're there. Yeah. Why is this adaptive layer important? And we're gonna get back to it as well later. In artificial intelligence of the 90s, or 80s and 90s, people stumbled into what was called the symbol grounding problem, which was made famous by John Searle in his, for his Chinese room argument. And the fundamental <laughs> issue is basically that if you think about the computational device that has to interact with the world, where does the knowledge come from, right? How does it learn? And what AI people thought they could get away with was just, okay, if we predefine all that knowledge, it will just be great. It didn't work. And we get back to this issue later. So DAC starts from that symbol grounding problem by saying, well, I'm using these sensations and actions together with these internal state triggers, like do I like this, am I happy, sad, etc." I use these as epistemic uh, drivers that says, this is important to you, right? So I classify the world, I can use statistics for that, as you do in deep learning, but I also label it in terms of what it means to me and for my survival. Plus I integrate it with action. So now I have, if you want, I acquire a state space. I have learned to represent the world, I've learned to, class to shape my states, my reactions to that world, and this is now where we hit the how level, if you want, the policies, where I bring the sensory motor states together with respect to my goals, right? So you want to become maybe the president of uh, Liechtenstein, although I think that they don't have a president, but that's a detail. Um, that's all playing out at this level, okay? But now what you also see that actually across these layers, we can draw three columns because there's a very neat mapping of world states, right? From sensors to episodic memory in the end hippocampus, self states from needs, I need oxygen to goals, I wanna become president, and action states from skeletal muscle control to your concrete policies like, and this is what I'm going to do in the coming second. Right, so this matrix structure is another heuristic we can now apply to the brain. It's okay, we can now decompose this neural complexity in terms of the layer where it resides in our control system and whether it is more biased towards world states, self states, or action states. So, um, okay, I get a message there on the screen. Um, so now we have um, a, a concept, right? So far I haven't proven anything about it. And now we're gonna map that to the brain. Uh, and so we're gonna unpack that in, in a more uh, specific way. So let's start with why and how we have dealt with this why question, right? So Tony already introduced you to this Barron's diagram that shows you how, uh, in this case, the, the behavior of the herring girl, right, can be decomposed in very distinct stereotyped behaviors and the importance of that is they don't need to be learned. Largely they're born with this capability. And we should not underestimate the importance and power of that. You don't need, you're not, it's not tabula rasa in, 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 in life and in nature. Certainly if, when survivability is at stake, things that are constant in sort of an 
evolutionary time scale, you might also expect to be strongly constrained by, by genetic factors so that you know, the moment you're thrown in the world, you can do it, okay? Um, are there things like imitation learning in animals that might shape this further? Okay, yes, there are examples of that, but I think for the heron girl, that's not the, the most dominant factor. So why I'm starting here is that you can think about this like, okay, this is some automaton. They're triggering variables and then automatically I generate some behavior that allows me to satisfy top level functions like nesting, escape, or uh, grooming behavior. However, if you now look at the details of these behaviors, here we look at a defensive attack in, in uh, rats, when you expose rats to a mouse, then if you look at the distance to the predator, you might see different responses dependent on the distance to that predator. Okay, so there's, this already shows you that these behaviors are not just binary triggers, like, oh, now we're gonna do X and now we're gonna do Y. There seems to be a very fine kind of regulation at work. These behaviors are regulated in a way that, again, uh, depends on the specifics of the behavioral context the animal is in. So how is this regulation then done? So if we're not just switching in a discrete way, right, but we have more gradual control, um, how is that exactly done? How do I then choose between a flight or a freezing behavioral program and how do I regulate the intensity of that behavior then dependent on the distance to that predator? How regulation, how is regulation achieved? Um, so a second piece of information here, which is very useful, is that, and this goes back to work by uh, Gray in his uh, Neuropsychology of Anxiety, which has gone through different versions, who gives us an idea about how we can think about this kind of regulation in brain terms. Okay, so what he proposed, and now we're gonna pursue that in a bit more detail, is that if you actually manipulate um, a number of, of very primitive brain structures like the PRX Dr. Gray, you can really disrupt the behavioral component that is expressed, like in defensive attack. You can manipulate these defensive behaviors if you go to very primitive brain structures like the central gray, um, that you would find along the ventricle here, the bottom of the brain. Um, but on top, so this suggests on the one hand there is this discretization of these behavioral patterns. But on top of that, what Gray proposes, now the regulation of them is realized through neuromodulators. And in this case it's serotonin and neuroadrenaline. So these are um, small groups of cells in the brainstem that project to many regions in the brain, releasing what's called neuromodulators. And neuromodulators can be seen really as switching the operational mode of neurons, okay? So, so now we can start to have a hypothesis about how at the reactive layer this behavior regulation is done. Because on the one hand we have controllability, depending on stimulus conditions we choose one behavioral program or the other that we can modulate dependent on stimulus context, plus we can have access apparently, to global signals that tell the rest of the brain to change their operating state. Um, so together with Marty Sanchez and others are different variations on that, we have modeled exactly this process in what we call an allostatic control system. Now that means if you look at these individual behavioral programs, you could think of them as being homeostatic, right? Escape is trying to optimize a single function increased distance to the threatening stimulus. But what we also see is that there must be an overall regulation between these behavioral programs. And you also, this was illustrated here in the herring girl, right? We can switch between these different behavioral programs. And moreover, escape might have higher, um, a higher priority for my survival than let's say grooming. Okay, so that's right. So how we modeled that is by saying, well, Within every behavioral system, I, I can optimize following a homostatic control. I have a single objective I want to optimize. I measure the state of the world and I minimize the discrepancy. But now across these different behavioral programs, I use what we call an allostatic controller 
that is setting the, the key parameters of the homeostatic controller. So if every behavioral program has its own homeostatic control, but I can change the threshold, so the time constants or um, um, their interaction. So on the one hand, we have applied this to explaining behavior of rats in an open uh, field. So here we measure the, the, the position of the animal in four different regions in this environment. Uh, we see that the animal spends a lot of time in this region two, which you can also call the home base. Okay. And then what we showed in these experiments, this was with uh, Mavi Sanchez here in, the, in Barcelona, um, we also measured the heart rate of the animal. And what we, what we show is that there's a strong correlation between the level of arousal of the animal and the vicinity to the home base. So why is that relevant? Well, that it would then suggest that arousal as an expression of a more gen general global monitory signal Right? preparing the animal for action. So going back to this, this proposal by Jeffrey Gray on how serotonin and noradrenaline is regulating hierarchical interactions in the brain, um, that also relates to the specific behavioral stage the animal is at. Right? So reduced arousal we observed in, in this region to the home base and increase in the center. So that gave an initial I mean, this, this is by no means a conclusive observation. It makes it sort of reasonable, but there's a lot of additional work we should do on this. In particular, measuring, of course, from these brainstem areas that are involved in regulating this kind of behavior, but they're, it's difficult, they're hard to reach. But from a computational perspective, what Marty also showed, which was interesting, is that this basic approach we took, which relies on a two-layer, if you want, control system, local homeostatic and global allostatic, also can give you near optimal solutions of complex mazes. Okay? So there's a lot of power in this kind. This would suggest there's a lot of power in, in these kinds of, of two-tiered reactive control structures um, that we can still further explore. So what's, what's the, the neural substrate of that? Right? So how can we now think about this in terms of the brain? Well, this maps to two proposals rather directly. Uh, going back to Björn Merker and Jacques Pengsepp, uh, who unfortunately died uh, recently. So Jacques Pengsepp was, of course, well known for his work on affective neuroscience or of emotions in neuroscience. <coughs> um, what they both so Björn Merker in this beautiful BBS paper he wrote on uh, hydrocephalic kits and, and consciousness makes his point that if we go to the brainstem and we, we replace ourselves here, periodic grace, uh, superior colliculus, so we're in the midbrain. Um, so, what Björn sees here is something that he calls a core behavior system, okay? And the core behavior system pulls together sensory states, superior colliculus. I mean, I'm not going to talk a lot about the superior colliculus, but what we know about the superior colliculus, it has visual maps, it has auditory maps, and it, it converges those to, to motor response maps. They're strongly predefined, there's some plasticity to, to maintain alignment. So what the Björn's saying, look, this superior colliculus here, we can see this as dealing with the sensory part of the world. And this maps to the zona inserta, which sits here between, and the zona inserta is, um, <coughs> is processing this with respect to um, internal states, integrates. And from there maps it to the periodic gray that sits here in the red brain, and the periodic ductal gray, as, as I discussed earlier, is a structure where you will find these, these behavioral programs stored rather locally. Okay? So the model of homeostatic allostatic control can be now be seen as a hypothesis on how this system is bringing world states together with internal states in the surface of then these stereotyped actions. And Jacques Pengsap, Pengsap has a very sort of comparable model of these structures in the, in the brain. But what he adds to that is that um, Jacques Pankstab is saying, well, look, they're actually, you saw earlier in this herring girl example, we talk about three top-level behavioral modes that are being regulated at this level of, of the brain. Uh, Jacques is, uh, Pankstab is talking about five, so that panic, fear, rage, nurturance and seeking, or exploration. Um, so that, that's 
something that we can try to delineate further experimentally because the question is, of course, would that be generic? Let's say, would all mammals have then that same kind of reactive behavioral mode controller? Is it five for all mammals, maybe all vertebrates, right? Or does it vary? Is there, is there further uh, variation in these, these basic programs? Um, okay, so now we have an idea about this, how this reactive control can be realized. Um, we've applied this to, to robots, so we have, we have made predictions, we discussed some of these. They should be pursued experimentally, but we're still looking for volunteers to do that. But I, I'm, I'm told I might convince Lay of that. <laughs> so now we have a working <coughs> hypothesis about this first order of control, right? It involves the hindbrain and the midbrain. This uh, drawing is from Swanson, who has a really nice little book on, on brain anatomy and, and systems neuroscience. Um, so another question, how do we map this now to learning about the world and learning about the body? And there I'm going to look at one system. Oh, so what? We have spent a lot of time on dealing with what? So I have why, we have a notion of why. Now I want to know how, how do we know stuff in the world? Um, and I'll show you just one example, which goes, it's, it's an older example, but I show it to you um, to deal a bit with this, this collective amnesia we have in the field. Right? Everyone is now running around and beating their chests about deep learning and how this is the big revolution, but uh, it was already discovered a long time ago by Rosenblatt in the 50s, and a lot of models have been published already, like this one here, 11 years ago, that already shows the capabilities of these kinds of learning systems. So what you do, in this case, we were wondering, okay, this is a standard view, it's a bit an outdated view, but okay, it's one way to look. What, what Fellman and Van Essen reported in this classic paper was the connectivity between areas in the mammalian brain based on tracer injections. And now there's, there's a big discussion, of course, of all the tracer used was not labeling all the cells, it was incomplete, maybe there was spillover and so on. But for the, the current discussion, it doesn't matter. There, there, there is a, a complex relationship between the, the retina and then the thalamus, the, the lateral vesicular nucleus, uh, primary visual areas, and in the end, the top level visual area, in this case, the hippocampus, episodic memory, right? So the, the question we posed here with Rito Wies and Peter Koenig, uh, already a while back, is can we think about these cortical circuits as being configured on the basis of the same principle? And why is that a relevant question? Well, anatomically, if you, if you go across the cortical sheet, you will, there is variability. You cannot say it's 100% it's ident identical if you take a volume of prefrontal cortex and a volume of V1, but they share a lot of similarity, right? There, there will be six layers, different cell types will be distributed in a rather comparable way. Okay, so that would suggest that the computational tricks across that cortical sheet might be identical or variations on the same theme. So here what we try to understand, and that's very much also the deep learning uh, uh, tribes uh, concerned today, is okay, can I generate such a hierarchical perceptual system on the basis of a single principle, one computational principle? And what we stumbled into was that actually, if you combine two computational principles, you can do it. And that is smoothness and decorrelation. So smoothness means that the learning that occurs at every, so here we go from the retina to let's say hippocampus. These are the receptive fields we have in this system. And what we basically say, look, if the tuning in every layer is, is, is driven towards slowly varying features, right? So you tune to things that change slowly. You change your receptive fields to things that change slowly. Plus, within the layer, you decorrelate the response. So you want sparse coding, going back to Bruno Oldshausen and Fields, right? That, who advances the notion of sparse coding as an important property of neural encoding. So basically, look, I want to have a minimum number of neurons responding to any input, but I want one neuron at least to respond. And if it responds, it should respond to something that changes slowly. Yeah, it's called smoothness. And also, Lawrence Viscott has been following up on this uh, in other work. So 
But another feature that we added to this, that's already uh, people in the deep learning community still have to discover this, but they will get there in another 10 years. We did not do this using just stored patterns that we present randomly. As a constraint, we really imposed the, the, the necessity to sample the world from the perspective of a moving agent that had egocentric perspectives on the world. And you might think that is a triviality, but actually it isn't, because um, as people from uh, DeepMind uh, had to discover after probably spending uh, millions of dollars, um, a behaving agent will face very high correlation between subsequent states, right? If I move through the world, it's not that this world is, com my next input state is orthogonal to the previous one. So you have very high correlation. And already in 92, there's a DEC paper where that problem is identified and, and solved through prediction. But um, what you see today in many of these, these deep learning systems, people sample inputs randomly because this kind of strong correlation cannot be handled efficiently. Um, so to avoid that trap, we immediately link this model to a behaving robot and pose the question, can it now learn such a hierarchy? Um, so here you see the learning progression over time. Here we have the levels in the model, right? Level one to level uh, five. So you see here level one first converges onto a set of receptive fields. Once this first level starts to um, reach some sort of stability in its um, classifier, classification, the next layer starts to kick in and so on, right? So, every, so you have a bootstrapping of these layers once you reach stability at earlier layers, you can bootstrap the next one, okay? Um, so learning is stable, even though I'm, I'm moving around in the world. And here what I show how if you go from these levels one to level five, you also get a higher position dependent. So here we have the space, y and x. Here we plot the, the response at, of a specific cell at level one, given my position in space. You see at level one, I'm very position variant which would suggest that you're tuned to some small features, while at level five, I'm very invariant and more specific to a certain location. And that's also illustrated here, where we just present patterns from all possible rotations and, and scalings. And then we pose the question, okay, um, how well can I now classify these patterns at level one? And then you see, if you look at a single neuron here, that they're highly specific uh, to a tuning well, if I go already to the next level up, they're more combinatorial and they can respond to more stimuli. Um, another experiment was shuffling. So we took the input space. Um, then we, we, we uh, shuffled the image in either larger regions or really tiny regions. And what you show is that, for instance, if you go to level three now, so we're sort of in the middle of the hierarchy, that you have a very specific degradation that, that means there is a tuning to the scale of the stimulus that is also hierarchically organized. And this was an important constraint to us because there's a nice experiment, uh, Reiner and Lokotetis, that shows if you go through the, the monkey, the macaque, this is the fMRI experiment in macaque monkeys, and you do this shuffling experiment, you see a very distinct degradation, right? That V1 is still responding rather well even though the shuffling happens on a high resolution because V1 likes little things. So it doesn't care too much about these bigger reshufflings. What if you go to areas high up in the hierarchy, they're very sensitive to sort of broader wide field stimuli. So they, they, they degrade much more rapidly um, in these kinds of experiments. So we use this physiological benchmark to account for that. And here we then show, actually these are border cells that we observed in this experiment, we're stretching the, the, the walls of the environment to show also the border cells that uh, Neil was talking about. So the top level, we can also show that we can have, so at level five, hippocampus, we have, if we reconstruct the position of the robot from just the neural responses, we have an error, a reconstruction error that is below 0.1. So let me... So I was going to... Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about... Why don't you ask it? Well, because I waited for you to finish the slide. Okay, thank you. Polite. So yeah. 
So, like, how many features of the hippocampal circuit can you actually capture from this system? Because you ended up showing, like, place cells, and it turns out you have border cells, but likely you have way many more. You know, no, like wait, you no, you're right. Look, wait, Diogo. I, I basically, I just want to show this essentially to emphasize the point of learning a perceptual hierarchy. I'm not going to push this now as my model of hippocampus. For that, we're going to switch gears, okay? okay right. But what is interesting, and this relates to the discussion with yesterday with Francesca. Remember, Francesca said, early on, you have already place cell-like responses. And then I also challenged her, yeah, maybe that's just a feature of the statistics. You can just learn it. That's I think, is illustrated here. You can just learn these things as long as you have this hierarchical classification, right? But uh, hippocampus does a lot more. We're going to talk about that. That's what we're going to get there. Thank you. Um, yes. We are, yes. So we're completely. So we are just optimizing smoothness and decorrelation, and we go around in the world, and that's it. It's unsupervised. Okay. Thank you. Those two what? Like the smoothness and uh, the correlation. Was it like based on any principle that you found out there, or uh -huh. you know? We well, it as you know, old house in the fields. That's late '80s already, right? They said, look, if you can you can learn these classification hierarchies if you just optimize sparse coding. If you say I just have a, a constraint that that minimizes the number of responding neurons in the hierarchy. And then they showed they could learn V1 type receptive fields and so on, right? So what we realized is that, imagine I want to, in the end, be able to detect this, this bench here, table, I really call this, okay? Imagine that if I move around in the world, subsequent changes in its features are slow and they're coupled to my behavior. So we want to have a learning system that sort of tunes to the time scale. But if you only take the rapid transitions, right? Okay, because as this edge moves across V1, I will have rapid transitions. So if I just tune to that time scale, I will, I will fragment the whole thing. I will not be able to pick up the gestalt, the overall relationship, because I will just be looking at the local features that very rapidly change. And we want to bias against that. So that's why I went for, for smoothness, okay? There was this idea that you want to get in the end, overall relationships in the world. And they change slowly, depending on your behavior. Well, these local features that everyone is now staring themselves blind on V1, yeah, these local features, they change very quickly. Right? Because your receptive field of a V1 neuron is the size of your thumbnail at this distance. Right? So that's why we chose smoothness. The thing we discovered is smoothness <coughs> only works when you impose decorrelation within layers. And that's a strong hypothesis of cortical circuits now which goes back to something we're going to talk about. Um, because, as you, we discussed earlier, is that we use these, these monitory signals to regulate, uh, to regulate the processing in these cortical systems. So um, that would suggest that there must be now an interaction between these two. Right? So that's something we looked at in many different ways. This is one example. There's something Jordi has been working on. Um, so what the, the question that Jordi posed, um, we have, we've looked at this problem from many different sides. It's really, OK, so if you have these neuromodulators that supposedly so important in configuring processing, right? Like, am I going to learn something? Am I going to pay attention to stuff? Am I going to break the system and, and look for something new? Am I going to go for novelty? How now is that this reactive controller that is driving these neuromodulators interface to this adaptive layer where I do my perceptual processing, right? And so, so Jordi, um, is, he's pursuing the whole system for all neuromodulators, but in this specific example, he looked in particular at the interaction between the cholinergic system and the specific um, inhibitory populations in the cortex. So this is parvalbumulin and somatostatin positive inhibitory neurons that have very distinct distributions. But what's more important here is that these inhibitory neurons also have very distinct uh, interaction ranges in the cortex, right? So the parvalbumulin cells have a more local interaction. Tell me when I mix it up. 
while the somatostatin neurons have a broader projecting field. So that would suggest that these local and global inhibitory systems are possibly in some push-pull relationship. Right? So if I start to, to inhibit my local inhibitory system, if I take it out of the game, then I get a global inhibition and I, I prevent myself from being sensitive to global relationships. Right? So this might therefore have a differential effect on my attentional and uh, capabilities and my learning. And that's also what then Jordi showed in these experiments. So here we have the error in the learning of, uh, of stimuli in a, let's say, a conditioning experiment, a conditioning, classic conditioning experiment. We have simulated tones, so there are patterns being projected in this bit of cortex. Then there are simulated uh, augmentative stimuli that would trigger this cholinergic response. And what Jordi shows is that over time, as this model, so here we have five different conditions. We have the blue case where we are not learning in this cortical circuit. Uh, the red case where we have a constant learning rate, so these are like the two control conditions. Now here I have the cholinergic modulation in green of, of these inhibitory populations by the oncogenic stimulus. And then here we have also the, the associated impact on the learning rates in the map by the cholinergic modulation. And what Jordi shows in these simulations and it also confirms other, experiment, other simulation studies we have performed or for quite some years, that actually this very distinct modulation of inhibitory interactions in cortical circuits by then these modulatory signals, right, that are part of this controlling hierarchy coming from reactive control, has a very distinct impact on how cortical maps are reconfigured in response to uh, external stimuli. Um, okay, so... Okay, could you go back to the previous slide? So I see that on the on the on known learning uh, condition, you have uh, a similar decay in the mean error. Mm -hmm. As for the other conditions, could you elaborate on That's why? Is Jordi, what's the answer? Um, the not so in this case uh, is the error in the conditioning paradigm that there's learning in two places: there's learning in the cerebral model and there's learning in the cortical. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So it's two phase. Yeah, it's a two-phase model, right? You're right. Okay. There's no learning in the cortex. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, something I didn't mention is that okay, conditioning, and we're gonna get back to can get back to that later. Remember, in the adaptive control layer, we have perceptual processing, internal state processing, and action processing. And if you map that now to the case of let's say Pavlovian learning, you see that distinct neural systems fit in distinct boxes in this scheme. The motor learning part maps better on the cerebellum, while the perceptual learning part maps better on uh, cortex. And this internal state processing, the adaptive internal state processing, is more related to structures like the amygdala. So this model that Jordi talked actually captures all three components. So at least we have a motor learning component here in the cerebellum. I'm going to talk about it a bit later. And then we have a sensory learning component here in the cortex, which is then modulated via amygdala by the cholinergic projections. But what I want to, I want to give you now two views on this what pathway, but saying, well, there are models that allow you to, to learn to represent that visual world. And then there's also distinct mechanisms that, that act like managers, if you want, of the interaction between reactive and adaptive control, as Gray proposed with his ideas on serotonin and noradrenaline, and here I'll give you this example. I gave you an example where we see that the cholinergic system can play that role. Okay, when? Um, no, we don't, want, we don't want to know this. We don't want to know that. We want to go know here. Um, so this is a drawing of Cajal, of the cerebellum, um, the little brain that sits in the back of your head, and the, the cerebellum has a very distinct uh, organization, right, where we have the inputs coming in over the mossy fibers, targeting the granule cells. So this would convey states of the world, if you want. Um, these would then give rise to the parallel fibers that go up and cruise through the molecular layer of the cerebellum. Um, 
also indicated here, right? This is the parallel fibers. And this, if you want, these are states of the world. These are states being projected onto the principal cells of the cerebellum called the Purkinje cells. But now, in addition, these Purkinje cells are targeted by what's called the climbing fiber. We see one coming up, up here. And the climbing fibers originate in the inferior olive, which is the brainstem nucleus, which is happily firing away at about one hertz continuously. But um, activity of these climbing fibers are very specialized. They target, um, in they would target one uh, Purkinje cell or very few. So there's an, ortho there's an orthogonality there. We have parallel fibers targeting many. Every Purkinje cell has about 100,000 contacts from these parallel fibers, but then they're contacted by a single climbing fiber. And uh, standard models of that um, also would then think about this climbing fiber as a teaching signal or an error signal that helps you to classify what comes in over these parallel fibers. Um, so we've been studying this now for, for a while, uh, in particular Ivan Herreros, who sits here, also with a project on the cerebellum, and also Giovanni uh, as Mafai has been in, involved in that. And our question now is, okay, how can I use this system to learn to optimize my actions? Remember, we have to have timing. We have to get the timing right. Of, I need to know, not only do I need to know what to do, I need to know when to do it. Um, so we have been elaborating different uh, schemes for that over the years. So this is the standard circuit I just described to you, coming from, uh, from Chris de Zeeuw. This is Ivan's model that he has been elaborating also with, with Giovanni. And the, the basic idea here is to say, well, we have a plant we want to control. These are the stereotype behavioral patterns we talked about. I can pack, I can blink my eye, I can withdraw my limbs, whatever. These are basic control programs I can run. But now, the, how is the cerebellum interfaced to those stereotyped behavioral systems? And the insight or the, the hypothesis that we're testing here is that, um, so Ivan calls that counterfactual predictive control, uh, which we have been testing, is that the, the cerebellum, and let me see, I have a comparison here. Okay, we can, well, I can first show how the model works. So the, the, the theory here is the following. I have to plant my skeletal muscle system I want to control. Then I have already a feedback controller. So this is my reactive layer that we looked at earlier, homeostatic, allostatic, predefined behavioral patterns. They know what to do. And you will find them in brainstem motor nuclei. And these brainstem motor nuclei are again interfaced to the sphere colliculus, um, following this whole idea of this core behavior system of Bjorn Merker. Okay? But if, even though I might know to how to close my eyelid to protect my eye from damage, I still have to tune the, the, the interval, the, the timing of that response to the specifics of the situation. Right? If, if Tony runs to me slowly, I close my eye a bit later than when Tony runs to me quickly. Yeah? Um, Tony has problems with obstacle avoidance. Um, so the model that, that we have been elaborating here at SPEX is that the cerebellum is, is not replacing that reactive response. This is significant. It's not replacing these innate stereotype patterns, but it learns how to manipulate them, right? So at this reactive layer, it's error-driven. Remember, I bump into the wall, so I'm Tony, I bump into the wall, I get feedback from the world, this hurts, and I, I rotate around, right? So, but now I want to avoid the wall before I bump into it, so basically what we propose the cerebellum is doing, it's sending error signals that didn't happen yet. They're counterfactual. I imagine there's an error coming up. So I see the wall, and I'm not saying like, oh, I have to now rebuild my whole control system and say like, okay, I'm, I'm now going to have a, a second layer of motor, motor programs. Let's say this is my avoid the wall program. The, the alternative is, that's the one we are pursuing here, I'm just telling these brainstem systems there's an error, even though it's not there. Right? So you fool these brainstem systems in believing there's an error, and that's how you then mobilize all these innate, rapid feedback control systems to deal with the problem. 
And why is that a beautiful solution? Not only because it's counterfactual, so that means already at that very low level we are in virtualizing the world, which is I think of great significance when we think about architecture, uh, consciousness and so on, different discussion, but we can deal with it if you're interested. But it's much more parsimonious. Because the standard model would say, ah, the cerebellum is directly talking to the plant. Okay, what does that mean? Right? A controller needs to model the plant. So if I bypass the primitive controller, I have to redo all that work. I have to build a new model of that plant. I have to learn how to control it. So I get redundancy. Right? That sounds like a wasteful thing to do. Moreover, so let me give you an example uh, of, of how this might look like. This is an earlier version of this model. Here we see it. Um, controlling a robot that first learns to avoid. Um, so here we have a virtual conditioning task on the robot. Uh, the green stripes are like the condition stimulus. They predict an upcoming collision. Um, and then once we hit the red so here you see the, the sensory responses to this visual stimulus, and here we have a, a real collision, right? So this was the robot bumping into the virtual wall, and now it tries to predict that prediction, and it is driving its avoided stereotype behavior to prevent this from happening. So we do many trials here. See it? So now you see a beautiful avoidance response which also shows you that therefore this cerebellar controller could actually help you to run through alleyways, which will be useful for us later on. Right? Also the rat runs through alleyways, doesn't bump into stuff. Maybe we're saying as well, the cerebellum can do that. And we can capitalize on that later on. Okay? There are generalization issues where we can, you can worry about and so on, but okay, so this works. So what's the, the difference here? Um, this is the, the model I just described to you. So this generating counterfactual errors that it sends into the, the predefined controllers. This is the stand, these are the standard models. The, the, the field of the cerebellum is dominated by feedback error learning models that basically say, look, you bypass that controller. Okay? So here we come up with a more parsimonious solution. And also there's another problem we solve with this model, which is probe trials. Right? I might learn that the world has certain regularities, but as you might have discovered, or maybe some of you are still too young for that, uh, the world is not fair, right? So the world does not always repeat itself. It's not Markovian in that sense, so there are exceptions. The standard models of, of feedback control are not able to deal with exceptions. If anything signals an upcoming problem, you immediately trigger your response and that's it, right? So if I have a probe trial, Tony pretends to collide to me, but he doesn't, I will still trigger all my avoidance behaviors, which might be very wasteful and also I might risk my life doing that. Um, okay, so we, we showed another, this uh, paper it has just been submitted with Giovanni as first author, where we demonstrate these features here. Again, you see an example of, this is the standard feedback control system in blue, right? That's really driving its own, if you want, uh, control over the avoidance responses. And here you have our counterfactual error response in these kinds of trials you just saw. So I, I don't see a strong difference with the Dean Porrell view, which also injects a, a signal ahead of the controller. Well, the Dean Porrell view would focus much more at this level about how am I classifying the incoming states, right? And I think the Dean Porrell view is actually not um, capitalizing on the full capabilities of the controller, right? Ivan, correct me if I'm wrong. I classify Dean Porrell in the feedback error learning uh, domain. I mean, uh, so the way Dean and Porrell see the cerebellum and the feedback layer is that it's, it's similar. Also, they have not focused on theoretical aspects as you did. And the, the main difference is that the kind of learning rule we, we use, we use it from a control perspective, and they use it from an information processing per perspective. So, indeed, uh, the difference are in this, this paper that was published in NIPS, uh, it makes the case uh, of where, what's the, mm -hmm. the contrast there. So, for, I always feel that Dean and Pearl are sort of agnostic about the, the, the way it plays out, 
They worry a lot about the adaptive filter perspective, how you get convergence and stability in these parallel fibers. Um, okay, so. Hmm? Oh, I don't know. We're halfway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, there was a nice experiment by uh, Reza Shatmer, who actually, after talking to Ivan, uh, did this, so we're still not sure where the ideas came from. But basically, this is a, a human who's, who's controlling a manipulandum, right? And then they have um, trials where the manipulandum is uh, distorted through so some force fields. Now they have to learn a, a correcting response, okay? So you, you move straight forward, you have this perturbation, so you learn to counteract the perturbation, so you go back to this forward trajectory. And what, what they did in this, in this paper, and it, it, it's an ingenious, it's very, it's very beautiful, they were measuring the EMG responses in the lower arm, okay? And then the question is, okay, from that EMG response, I can infer the error signals that are being sent down by, supposedly, the cerebellar controller, right? So, so what are we gonna measure here? Am I gonna measure the position that I should attain, or am I gonna send, see some sort of modulator, a modulator that reflects error? Okay? And that's essentially what they saw in these experiments. So they, they saw that the, um, in these trials, after, after learning, that the deflections that, that people learned, that you could pick up in the muscle, were very closely tied to the actual error that was imposed by the, the forced feedback, by the perturbation. So that means this lowest level of control, where you can read out the, the, the downstream signals, it seemed to reflect this corrective error or the counterfactual error, if you want, uh, as opposed to a direct, let's say, kinematic uh, control um, response. Okay, that basically means Ivan was right, and that's good. And then it, there's also a nice mapping to the details of uh, cerebellar uh, circuits. So let's now look at how we deal with where. We have the hippocampus, you know a lot about the hippocampus, um, but the one thing that we might not have emphasized enough is that um, there's this convergence of lateral and medial cortex in the sense that lateral, and this was mentioned in some of the talks, is more tuned towards perceptual states while medial is the fa are the famous grid cells. Okay, now it's becoming a bit more variable, but still this is more related to space and action. Okay? So what we were pursuing here with John Lisman was this basic question, What's the computational advantage of doing that? Right? Well, well, why would, would this integration happen at this level? And we had a hypothesis that's essentially that in order to get optimal behavior, you want to integrate sensory motor states, like the sensory motor interpretation of also cognition, which might match also the Rizzolatti's ideas about mirror neurons, that we always are operating in a sensory motor space and not in a separate sensory think act sequential space. And what we explained with this model, so already we actually proposed the very first uh, model of the, of the grid cells. It was a continuous attractor that could account for the grid cells uh, dynamics. This was two years after they were reported, worked with uh, Alexi Guanella, uh, 2007. Then with Rito, you saw earlier, our perceptual hierarchies, this could represent the lateral interanal cortex. We have high level representations of the perceptual world. And now we're going to look at how these are integrated in the dentate gyrus and CA3 and, well, CA1 we might reach uh, at some point. Um, so here you have grid cells on the robot. Just to give you an idea how this works, this, this continuous attractor model, basically what you're saying is, look, I have cells that are wired up in this specific triangular pattern that you will find in the grid cells. They're driven by a head direction system that pumps energy into this network and then the activity starts to move through this network. But because the network is connected like a, a twisted torus, activity keeps on running around. There's no, there's no edge, right? There are no boundaries in this map. It keeps on running around. And then by virtue of that, you can get very well-tuned uh, grid cells, okay? And this already demonstrated uh, 10 years ago. Yes. Um, so, what's, so we built a detailed model of this system taking into account the known physiology and anatomy, and what, but what's your benchmark? This is a big problem with all these models, right? What's, you saw different models of hippocampus, 
um, or of, of vision, but the question, but what would make a model more comprehensive of, or valid as another model, right? So what's, what's this empirical adequacy? And in this case, we took uh, a classic result coming from uh, the Moser lab um, that we didn't talk about a lot, and that was rate remapping. And these were experiments that were now classic, where the, the animal was placed in a rectangular box, taken out, the box was smoothly changed in shape, and then what you do, you, you correlate the population response in different parts of the cerebellum. So here with dentate gyrus, uh, the hippocampus, dentate gyrus with CA3, right? So we're in this input pathway now uh, from the entorhinal cortex. So dentate gyrus is step one, green, and then CA3 is step two. Um, if we just ignore CA2 for the moment. Um, and what you see in this population vector, so here we see a single cell and how it changes its responses across these different environments. But you see here this gradual degradation of the response so that at that time uh, that we started to do this, there was a, a big conundrum about that. Because also as Francesca explained to you yesterday, if you think about CA3 memory as being driven by an attractor state, then you would expect that when, when these environments are rather similar, the response should stay identical because an attractor keeps you in that state. And there's a resistance to jump out of the attractor. However, if it's an attractor, so you would expect this to be flat initially, and then you would expect a sudden transition because now you jump into another attractor, right? That's why people were very impressed with these results. Like, this doesn't make any sense. If this is a attractor memory system, we should see these discrete transitions. Um, so we took this as a benchmark. Um, we also then modeled um, the basic dynamics of the theta gamma cycle. You've heard about phase precession and sweeps. That means hippocampal cells spike in gamma. So if you measure their interspike intervals, you, you are in a frequency range that's above 40 hertz. But these gamma responses seem to be organized again in a slower cycle, which is then theta, right? So the, which would be somewhere around four to 10 hertz. So this is John Lisman's idea of this theta gamma coding. Uh, it's also phase precession that also uh, Neil Burgess was talking about, that cells start to respond later in the theta phase if you're far away from the center of your place field and then slowly become, get closer to it. So there's a very distinct modulation of these responses um, in the hippocampus um, areas, which we also included in the model. And then what we showed is that this model if you now just manipulate the mixing of visual st of sensory states of the world and action states of the world, you can recover this degradation in dente gyrus very accurately uh, with a mixing factor of, of 0.3. That means 30% of the synapses onto a neuron in a dente gyrus in this case are conveying information from the grid cells about space and action, while 70% is informing you about um, about sensory states of the world. And then actually, um, Edward and his people went on back in the lab with that prediction in mind, because then th the prediction was, well, if you lesion lateral entorhinal cortex, you should degrade the rate remapping, because lateral entorhinal cortex has the largest, is the largest contributor to the rate remapping, and that's also what they, what they found. Um, I will skip over CA3 because we want to see how the whole brain works. But anyway, we ex this is Caesar. Um, how? Um, OK, in how, we didn't talk a lot about prefrontal cortex, so maybe I will, I will skip that bit. But the big question there is really, how does an executive system that now receives all this information about my motivational states, my goals, my perceptual evidence, my memory of the things I've done in the past, and the goals that I'm pursuing, how do I integrate that information? And the standard view is like drift diffusion, which is like, well, I get evidence, I'm an integrator, I get evidence, and I start to shout relative to the evidence I receive. And the integrator shouts the loudest after a certain threshold is reached, that's what you're gonna do. I can go left, I can go right. So these two units are integrating their evidence and they compete. 
right? And who reaches the threshold first, that's the winner. And this was very, and this has impressed people a lot because if you look at um, decision making in, in, in macaques, and there's a, there's a lot of experiments that go on. So in this case, the monkey has to look, fixate a target, you have mo moving dots, and dependent on the dominant movement of these dots, the monkey has to make either a movement with the hand or a saccade with the eyes, left or right. In this case, it's a saccade task. And what you then see is on the one hand that the coherence of, these mo of the movement, here motion strength, correlates in a very clean way with both the accuracy of the response, like the more coherent the movement, the more correct the response, and also the quicker the response. So if the, if the monkey gets more evidence to go in one direction, it will be accurate and fast. If, if, the, if the motion is more ambiguous, you'll be inaccurate and slow. Right? So, so far, so good. But then the big surprise which people have built up is that if you go through this whole processing hierarchy and you look at the uh, lateral interparietal area, which really mediates between, if you want, the perceptual processing and the eye movement, frontal eye field is driving superior colliculus and initiates this eye movement the animal's going to trigger. If you measure in that area, what people observe, this is another paper by, by Anne Churchland, also from, from Shetland, in which Shetland at the time, that here we measure from neurons in this LIP area, and you see that their firing rate, right, so here it spikes per second, their firing rate correlates very cleanly with the motion coherence. So people thought, look, this is, this is amazing because actually now I have a neuron that reports to you very accurately what's the evidence to make a certain movement, right? So, um, and then a paper came out that, that made the claim that neural variability is actually non-specific, it's widespread, it relates to the stimulus onset, but it's not specific to the actual computations being performed. This was like a consensus paper, right, uh, from 2010. Um, this is problematic because if you believe that the brain also operates with different codes, temporal codes, for instance, phase codes, frequency codes, then you can, you can retire, right? Because supposedly none of that is relevant. It's all rate, integration of firing rates. The rest is worst. Uh, so we, we checked that with Encarni Marcos and uh, Stefano Farena in Rome. Uh, in this case, the monkey had to do a countermanding task. We measured in the premote, dorsal premotor area. So the monkey now was performing a similar task, move the hand left or right, but we added a little twist. And that is that there would be interrupts, there would be stop signals. So at certain trials, the monkey had to stop the movement it had initiated. And what's interesting about that is that way you can control the errors the monkey makes. So think about, about yourself, you have to make a movement. If you initiate that movement, there will be a point in time where there's no, no more return. Even though I tell you, stop this now, that's it, you're ballistic, right? So here you can control the errors the monkey is making. Um, so illustrated here, for instance, if I, have, if I just had a go trial, so no error, or I just had a stop trial, if, it's, if I now at T again get a go trial, I can just reach, I get my reward. Then you see, if my previous trial was a stop, I'm much slower. But also, I make less failures. So you, now you see that this, this psychometric behavioral curve of accuracy and reaction time is modulated by my error history. So that means now I have a memory component in the task. I'm remembering my errors. I remember how well I did. And this modulates my current performance. So then we looked at the firing rate over 100 plus neurons in this premotor area. And now suddenly you see that the firing rate is not allowing you to distinguish between the two conditions. So firing rate tells you nothing. You cannot say anything about the decision making of the animal anymore. Um, so that means drift diffusion in this case cannot work anymore. I cannot distinguish the two cases. Even though we know in terms of performance it makes a big difference. So uh, then we looked at the intertrial variability. So basically what you say there the neural responses actually is re expressing two components. One is like a baseline variability that neurons have intrinsically, and then there's a modulation of the baseline 
and you try to distinguish these two features, and you try to, to interpret the computation just in terms of the, the task-specific variability. So if you apply this variability measure, then suddenly you see you can get a very accurate distinction between these stop and go conditions. Uh, and also that from there you can very accurately predict the performance of the animal. So the variability is everything. Okay. So, okay, then we built a model of that. That shows that a monitoring system is controlling competition across your action options. All right. So now let's see how we can bring that together. So I, I, we went through the different steps here. So I mean, could you say that, that rather than tracking uh, one parameter, this is tracking two parameters? So. What do you mean, the neuron? Uh, well, the system is, it, it's no longer just about accumulating a mean, it's about, or sort of a, uh, a running average. Mm -hmm. it's, it's now accumulating uh, a, a variance as well. Um, well, what, what we show in the model is that you can explain this variance response as a, an echo of the of the, the attractive dynamics in the network. But so imagine I have um, my different action options, which are coupled through inhibition, so they can compete. I have an action selection system. Yeah. If you tone down the, the inhibition in that system, so the competition gets weaker, as the, as the excitatory units are being driven, you will have higher variability. If you crank up this inhibition, you will reduce the variability because you much more quickly will enhance small differences. Right? So variability is an echo of that comp competitive process. And that competition is then set by your error memory. But the, what we're really after in the DEC perspective is that decision making in this system will depend on, on perceptual evidence, memory bias, goals, and valence. So I'm claiming there's a four-factor model needed and we also recently discovered that motor cost is also taken into account. Okay? But just one variable of per perceptual evidence is definitely not enough. But you could, if you have two variables, you could imagine it's kind of common filter type integration. Yeah, but I don't think it would account for the physiology. The variability is not explained with that. Y you would give me some classifier and say, okay, I can classify multiple things. Mm -hmm. But you have to explain the physiology, which means their variability accurately predicts performance in reaction time and error rate, okay? So sure, I'm sure you can build some classifier that could, can describe that, but it would not take into account then the physiology that we know. Um, so then we, so okay, we wrote lots of papers about all these different things, and then time came to put it all together. That's this paper here that uh, Giovanni and Diogo worked on together, it's called uh, DEC10, where basically the drive was to say, well, okay, so we have these subcomponents, how can we fit them together? We in particular brought together cerebellum, hippocampus, and prefrontal, the models that I showed to you, because we now want to answer Tolman, right? How does the rat make the decision when it's at the choice point? And what I'm saying is, okay, the rat at that choice point actually relies on interaction across all these systems to either decide to go left or right. And this will again depend where in this hierarchical system the control resides. Is it early, more reactive, exploratory? Is it late, habitual? Or is it intermediate, deliberate? Okay. So we built that model. So we, we go again for uh, VTE. So now I want to see a robot VTEing in a maze. And the specific signature you want to see there is this beautiful bit of physiology from Johnson Radish, also 10 years old. Because now you see the rat standing there at this decision point, you saw the video, but if you measure from CA1 in its hippocampus and you plot the response fields of the active neurons back into space, you see as the animal stands there, it's really sweeping into this alley or that alley. Yes, it really, it, gives us further evidence for this Tolman interpretation of vicarious trend. The animal is imagining it goes left or right. And we see this reflected in the neural response in the hippocampus. Um, and there, there are many examples of how these sweeps. So here we have another example of the animal stands here and we look at these positions that are being covered in this look ahead. You see that those sweeps are also neatly organized in time and that they follow exactly this data gamma code that also John Lisman likes so much. 
There's a very specific, specific structure to these sweeps that we want to explain, right? We want to see in our model this kind of look ahead that is driven by the goals of, of our system. Now, this is the big question. How do you get goals, goal states, that might be encoded in our prefrontal cortex, right? This is the guy that says, okay, our goal is to get coffee and get ready for the next talk. How do I get that information specifically into my hippocampus? How do I get now a movement vector out that informs this executive system that that's the right thing to do so I can put it in my motor cortex, right? How's that done? We saw the bits, how are the bits now glued together? And there, there was a beautiful piece of data coming out of the Moser lab again, um, where they looked at the ceramic um, nuclei, and I have a better, um, so the nucleus reunions in the, in the thalamus, where they showed by just measuring the responses in a maze in these different systems, that in the prefrontal cortex, you can find distinct responses in the maze, okay? You can also see these mapped into the thalamus, and in turn, you can see them mapped back into the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So now we have an interface between this contextual layer of DEC and the adaptive layer via the reunions in the thalamus, basically meaning here for my goal, so our hypothesis, goal states here, goal states are sort of projected into the hippocampus to say, okay, where should I go to get this done? Okay, so that's how you now link a hypothesis on how, with, where. Um, so that, this is the model that then was put together, layers of DAC, the different subsystems that were modeled, uh, cerebellum hippocampus PFC I have described to you, so you have an idea of what's going on there. Um, so we put it on a robot. The robot is exposed to a foraging task, which sort of uh, does something like this. Well, this is the robot in the T maze. That's not a task we, we tested it on, but see there are two targets. Tries to figure it out. Now it's doing its vicarious trial and error. Like, and that means in our, for, in our case, so what we are advancing here is the hypothesis that vicarious trial and error is part of deliberation because it is deliberate information sampling. You rotate in a certain direction to get the sensory information you need to consult your memory system or to validate your memory system. So here's the foraging task. Blue, naive animal, red is the experienced animal. This is the home base, so the different targets, the obstacles. It has to bring these things home and then it, can, it gets a reward, can consume them here. That's, there, that's also what has the little gripper. Um, so we can, here's the etogram of, uh, oh, not really the etogram, this is more the detailed physiology of the controller because of course the robot allows you now to look at all these subsystems and what they do, but also for the sake of time, let's just focus on the cerebellar part. We have our cerebellar model. Here we have three positions in this space. This is what the robot would see in these positions. Here we have the responses of distinct neurons in the CA3 part of this uh, control model, modeled and in the way I just described to you, right? So this is a rather uh, well-grounded model. We see um, distinct responses in these different positions in the CA3 area, so position one, two, and three. Now we can look at distinct cells in CA3, so cell 14, 899, 161, and then you see that the, we have distinct responses in every position, but I can also identify distinct place cells uh, that fire for specific positions in the environment, so position one, two, and three. Okay, so we can, we can learn these, these CA3 cells, uh, but can I use them for my, for my planning? So here we now see a naive versus a trained um, robot, and here we see the, these sweeps that are being made, so how does this work out? So I'm in this position, okay? Um, the goal system, the prefrontal cortex, generates a goal state and says, okay, I'm thirsty, what should I do? Then within this, this CA3 memory system, you basically propagate activation dependent on that goal state. And now a number of positions will become active that in the past were associated with that specific goal. 
So now I can just extract a vector that tells me, okay, if I go in this direction, I'm going to hit the target. But the other thing that then, that then of course, happens is um, if I have a movement vector that the, that the hippocampus reports back to PFC, how do I deal with my obstacles? Right, because the hype, what, we, what we learned from this experiment is that hippocampus gives you this movement vector, says, okay, move there to get coffee. But there's a chair in the middle. How, so how do you deal with the goal and that sub-goal? So what we show in this model, I'm not showing you the data, but um, is that I showed you earlier how this worked out in the cerebellum with the robot learning to move through the alleyway. Right? So what we propose here is that you have parallel control. That in this sort of adaptive contextually hippocampus prefrontal system works in a vectorial space of events and global rela allostatic, allocentric relations between them. It says in world coordinates, go there. Then it delegates the problem of dealing with the local egocentric problem to other systems like the cerebellum. Right? So as I'm trying to follow this global vector, my cerebellum happily helps me to move around this chair. Okay, so it's a parallel distributed control system. Again, underlining why DAC is called DAC, right? We have distributed control, vectorial, event-based, global, versus egocentric, local, fast, precise, and adaptive. But it, they're not exclusively controlling one or the other. They work in parallel. Yeah? And in this case, we see that we use distinct interface components. And that's also if you want to talk about the, the critical points in the architecture. This is a critical point in the architecture, right? Where an episodic memory system receives distinct instructions from an executive control system that sets goals. Um, okay, so we accounted for sweeps uh, and look ahead, mental time travel in the robot, explaining these effects. There was a Johnson and Reddish, Johnson and Reddish reported 10 years ago. Um, all right, so you saw that. So we had DAC, we had the brain. Um, Okay, I don't know, okay. We can then pose the question, okay, so we have this model, this will be quick. We, we have a model of the brain in which we can at least emulate, if you want, physiological properties of, of that system. We can emulate the behavior we see in rats. There's, there are differences that we have to sort of look at more carefully. But how does this bring us closer to the notion of general intelligence? Can we build, let's say, a, a brain-derived architecture for general intelligence? And that's also what then Alan Newell, one of the founding fathers of symbolic AI, was after, where um, he defined general intelligence as a system for which anything can be a task. And that's very much also what humans believe they're capable of. Although it's not really true, I can't walk on the ceiling right now. But we can build tools. Um, so in order to get there, Newell proposed a benchmark for these unified theories of cognition, which has 13 criteria. And I think this is really important. It goes back into this question of what makes a model, what makes a valid model, what's an empirically adequate model, right? Um, I mean, MATLAB is patient, you know? You can throw in numbers, have some rules, stuff happens. But what is stuff that we care about? So, Alan Newell had sort of this, this list of, of uh, features that uh, you can summarize actually in a more condensed way by, by distinguishing functional constraints from structural constraints. So he talks about the psychology of mind, if you want, where you talk about, um, for instance, be, behave flexibly, adapt, be rational, goal-oriented, um, use symbols, abstractions, and so on. But then he has structural constraints. Okay, like be constructible by an embryological growth process, arise through evolution, be realizable as a neural system. Okay, so, uh, so I summarized it in, in these forms. So basically we have a level one and a level two functional objective, which is basically deal with the physical world and deal with the social world. And those that know a bit more about DEC also know that this is H4W and this is H5W, which are distinct, I think, 
distinctly different computational uh, problems. Then we have our structure constraints of biological validity, validity. That's also what Alan Newell talked about. But on top of that, I think we have to think more carefully about physical realizability. Alan Newell doesn't talk about that. Alan Newell has a bit this, the, the Microsoft approach to building general intelligence, which I have infinite memory, we have infinite power, we have infinite computation. For, this is not true, right? We, we, we are, we have to think sort of from, in a biological perspective about realizing these functions on a very tight energy budget, on a computational budget, et cetera, right? There are strong physical constraints on, on computation that thus far have not been realized sufficiently. So if you now look at the, um, okay, so we've been applying that to, to robots, but here we have SOC um, conversing with our, with our uh, ICAP robot that you teach it how to speak, how to learn body maps, and so on. So we've been mapping that to humanoid robots. I will skip over that part. If you're but the robot learned to say, I took the octopus because I want the octopus. So now we can have a discussion about free will in robots. This is a work that Clement has been very actively engaged with. Um, but there are, so right now, this is the, the current trend in AI, where there's a strong wish for human level competence, right? So, so big companies are jumping on this, this AI train, and there are two dominant views, right? One is strongly driven by data, right? I learned, and I learned to play Go, I learned to classify all the states of the game, and I map all these states onto my actions that I can take to win. There's a clear reinforcer at the other end. An alternative approach, so this is very much the, the deep mind uh, approach. Um, the alternative approach comes from MIT, uh, Tannenbaum and his friends, where they say, no, 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 you, you cannot do this all with learning. To get human level performance, you need to, to build on very strong priors. You already must have access to a physics engine and a psychology engine. You must already be able to simulate the physical world and simulate the psychological world, and only then can you bootstrap general intelligence. Um, but I think they're, they're both wrong, um, and they both have limitations, right? So here you need massive data with, with actually quite some pre-structuring by humans. They don't learn just out of the box. Well, here you need massive prior knowledge and a little bit of data, okay? So with that, we're back in the old empiricism, rationalism debate, um, like where does knowledge come from? They both don't have a good solution, or we're gonna skip over this. Um, so, th this is still a big challenge, and the point is, DEC actually started from that challenge. Right? DEC started from that fundamental question, where does knowledge come from? And it says this, this hierarchical view on brain architecture and the architecture of the mind is exactly the way it is, because it has to bootstrap its knowledge. So, so the symbol grounding problem, this problem of priors, is, is exactly the fundamental problem brains are trying to solve. It's not an add-on that you solve somewhere down the line. You must start from that fundamental challenge. And that's what DEC does. Um, so, we had Tolman's question, why does the red turn the way it did? Um, I gave you the DEC interpretation of that. Um, DEC has been generalized to, to many other domains, and one example you're gonna hear after the break from Belen, where we go more in the direction of, of neurorehabilitation, how can we repair the brain? In other words, we're saying, well, to understand the brain, we can build it on a robot, but also to understand the brain, we can fix it, okay? Which I think is a direction we should push more for neuroscience and also computational neuroscience. Um, so we have mapped the DEC theory to consciousness. If you have an interest in that, please uh, come to me. I can tell you all about it. It also departs from the core behavior systems of Björn Merker. Uh, I like Björn a lot, he's really great. Um, so we have mapped DEC to many different domains, which also shows you that when we build brain theory, it's not only about explaining the brain, it also gives us operational power in the real world. And that's what we try to also capitalize on, certainly with this move to the Bioengineering Institute that we celebrated last Monday, also with Edward Moser being here. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to be done. And uh, with that, brain theory is therefore not only a great adventure to try to understand the brain of a rodent, it also helps us understand ourselves, who we are, 
our strengths and weaknesses, and it also allows us to improve the human condition. Thank you very much. The, um, the vicarious trial and error thing. Um, so that is, it. if you don't know your, you don't know how to reach your goal, you, or be, because it, it, it's a bit weird uh, for me that that would be a strategy for finding your goal because you would have to explore so many uh, paths. So, um, and, and then also you, you uh, talked about how the prefrontal cortex could uh, say, this is your goal, so you have to go this way. So, so how, does, how do those two things um, um, relate to each other? Like in one, in one case you are um, just like randomly saying what would happen if I go this way and in the other way you are actively, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so how does... Okay, so the, the idea is um, that learning progresses through very distinct stages, okay? So when you're thrown into a new world, you will display exploration behavior at this, defined by this, at this reactive layer, where indeed you try different options. But as you try different options, you start to form memories, okay? As soon as memories become a bit more mature, and actually if you look at the play cell responses that develop very quickly, they can start to now inform exploration. You can say, oh hey, I've been there, this looks familiar, I got this reinforcement there, right? Slowly you start to get, after a few trials, at least some initial hypothesis about that space. And that's where VTE, vicarious trial and error comes in, in my opinion. If I have these initial hypotheses that's not really validated yet, I can now evaluate them by just looking around. I can say, well, if I turn left, the world should look like this and that. So you can check that. Does the world look like this and that? So you can strengthen that memory if it's correct. So in that phase, VTE, I see as a way to explore my intrinsic memory, to calibrate it and consolidate it. This is the role of VT. Like I have initial hypothesis, but I want to check them against the world. And I don't really want to go there because in the meantime, as a rat, I also have been, I have a prior that says stay out of trouble, don't expose yourself too much, right? So this, this would be the interpretation, that you have phases of learning and VT sits in the middle from the initial exploration phase to a deliberation phase. And from there you go to a habitual phase. So the uh, DAC framework is uh, pre pretty stable now for a number of years, and the, the main diagram you show, I don't think I've seen it change for maybe three, four years at least. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you have these more sort of specific architectures like DACX, which are mapped onto specific brain subsystems and you know, uh, and meet in, in some strong way some uh, criteria for explaining experimental data. So uh, the question is, is the main DAC framework, is it falsifiable? What would it take for you to change any of the arrows in that model mm -hmm. based on the uh, more detailed models that you're building? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, um, there's, there's a lot more movement behind that than you, than you might think, um, or than might, might appear to be the case. Uh, let me see, where is it? Oh, here. Um, so, for instance, one thing that I'm puzzling over a lot is the detailed structure of this contextual layer, okay? Um, I think at this level, I don't think much is going to change from this very abstract perspective, okay? But here, I think we're going to see a bit more, uh, quite a few reshuffling. For instance, I believe consciousness is a very distinct memory system that really helps you to virtualize your interactions with the world. Okay, let's, let's take it as a hypothesis, but okay, this is my hypothesis. I don't, didn't really account for that here yet. Then this virtualization memory is linking self to world, 
So how is it exactly interfaced to autobiographical memory and how is autobiographical memory exactly interfaced to this episodic memory system, right? So there's a lot of reshuffling still necessary at this level. How is monitoring, for instance, linked to metacognitions? Metacognition, self-evaluative states, that also Maria is investigating in, in educational contexts, are these self-evaluative states part of any of these memory systems or should it be a separate box, right? So the action sits at this level. This, there's a lot of reshuffling here. and Maybe at some point I should draw another layer. Like uh, the hesitation is this virtualization memory of consciousness that gives you norm extraction, in my opinion, is operating at a very different level of, let's say, um, utility valuation than a standard executive controller that's trying to optimize going left or right in a maze, right? So this is not consolidated, in my opinion. That's why there are too many arrows, for instance, going from goals and so on. There's, there's action up here. This is where we are. So how should we think about this diagram? Because it's, uh, I mean, is it better to talk about it as a framework rather than a model? Because there's, there's different instantiations of DAC in, in models. And this, uh, to me, seems more of a way of thinking about how to build models than a model itself. I mean, uh, are we ever going to realize the full DAC yeah. architecture? Sure, absolutely. And that's also the attempt in WYSIWYG, right? That's what, well, that's but, what Clement has been working on and Vicky and others. So, yes, so uh, I, it, is, it is a framework, absolutely, but it is not such a loose framework. There are distinct constraints. So it's really a theory about how you bootstrap a cognitive structure, and the goal is definitely to build the whole thing. But, as you saw earlier, right, I, I showed you the reactive layer now with three boxes, but if you start to unpack that, things become complicated. Yeah. But yes, the idea, this is a theory, and I want to build the whole theory. That's, that's the goal. Okay, we need a coffee break. Oh, there's another question there. Yeah. Oh, another question? The last one. <laughs> Yeah, just, just a quick one. How do you link this with the story that John Doyle was telling us? And basically Which story? The story that John Doyle yeah. was telling us, mm -hmm. in particular with this high variability in what you call here the lower and the higher layers, they say, but with a strong invariable system in the middle, mm -hmm. he called the OS. Mm -hmm. do, you, is, do you think it's compatible? Or? Yeah. No, actually, the, the John. Uh, John and I started to discuss these matters in Telluride like five years ago, 45 years ago. And um, so, so this whole analysis of, of layered control also f for him started with, with looking at these diagrams, right? So, and I think he really, he really gives us extremely relevant challenges there because now we can think about this in different terms than psychological, behavioral, neuroscientific terms, also pure computational terms. Right, that we were discussing yesterday. So indeed, now we can say, what's the operating system here? What are, what are sort of the, what's the generic management of all these resources? And what is stuff that's like implementation variant? What are the apps that can run the thing? What, what's the generic core, right? So the content of working memory are like apps, so it can be anything. The stuff we think about, the tasks we do. Certainly if you follow Alan Newell, anything can be a task, right? Those are the apps, they don't matter. But there must be some constraints on that working memory with respect to its capacity, um, how do you keep it also clean, and how do you prevent mixture states, and so on. Right? So I, but I would claim that <coughs> we will see, let's say, multi-scale operating systems. That's my current intuition about this. That, for instance, the example from Jordi's work, we have this cholinergic modulation of huge chunk of sophia cortex. I think that's an operating system kind of intervention where you say, wait, we, we shift the whole mode of operation, forget all the stuff you have been memorizing, now we're gonna start again, as an example. Right? So I think that the, 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 the narrow part, the brittle part, will sit in the cholinergic system, or in these modulatory systems, for instance. And that indeed, many pathologies result when there are problems with these modulatory systems, as for instance, Parkinson's disease, or for, for us to call in, you might have anxiety disorders, Right, also for serotonin and so on. So I would think about, I don't think it's one operating system, I think it's multiple. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying they all line up with this 
hierarchical structuring of the deck diagram. I think the control perspective, computational perspective of John Doyle is, is really very, very useful for us. We have to definitely take it very serious. There's a lot of stuff to explore. Um, and I, my prediction would be that core systems of the brain, like the, the core behavior system that the Bureau of America talks about, it's interfacing to neuromonitory systems, um, the core thalamocortical system would be examples of then that operating system. 